Desmond Borge, welcome to An Actor Despairs. How are you doing, brother? I'm doing well, brother. Thank you for having me. Oh, man, it's such an honor and a pleasure. You know, you're one of, I think, one of the greatest talents working right now. You know, when, when I... When I, I don't know if you ever had to do the one-on-one -on -one thing, but back when I was still doing that, you know, we'd always kind of sit in class before. For those who don't know what that is that are listening, it's basically a, um, a facility where you get to meet and network with casting directors with like-minded actors. And, you know, all the people that were regulars there would always talk about what actors we worship. And you were the one that we always talked about, man. Like, we oh, love your man. work. Wow. You know, like Sig Day Miguel and C. Vincent are brothers of mine. Oh, the, the house that oh. Jack built, your work yeah. in that is so great, man. And Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. man, you know that, oddly enough, the premiere of that movie in New York City is where I met my now wife. No way. So, yeah, 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 because E.J. Bonilla, who plays the lead, who plays Jack in the house that Jack built, his cousin is my wife's best friend, and she had an extra ticket to, to the premiere and brought her along that night. I was wearing a cool white bone beluga whale tie clip. She uh, she complimented me on it when we first met in the beginning of the night. And then through the after party um, into having uh, a really late dinner at like three o'clock in the morning at that diner off of what, 42nd and 9th Avenue, 43rd. Oh, I, know, Avenue. I used to live right Remedy or yeah, I know exactly what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. So we went, we, we went there. She was wearing some clip-on earrings. She took them off. They were these anti-clip-on earrings. I put them on. I was just joking around. And at the end of, like, the dinner, you know, I mean, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. It's not dinner. We're all just going home trying to put – after putting some food in our bodies. And uh, uh, she was like, can I have my earrings back? And I gave her one. And I said, I'll give you the other one if you uh, allow me to take you out to dinner sometime. Oh. And, she, and she said, I'll mull it over, which was – pretty awesome and then we like <laughs> split a cab i dropped her off in the east village on my way back to brooklyn and then we exchanged numbers and then like i don't know three weeks later you know we went on our first date and the rest wow. is history man so so yeah so steve the house steve, at jack bill yeah steve vincent and sig day miguel in a way got you your wife they, they, yeah, we, you know, if I, if I had thought, if I had thought about it more clearly, we should have had them officiate the wedding. Right? Some portion of it. it would have been more fitting that way. <laughs> That's so funny, man. Well, dude, let, let's start from the beginning because my whole family's from yeah. Chicago and you grew up in Chicago, right? Yeah, I was uh, uh, born at St. Francis Hospital in Evanston and we grew up in a seven flat graystone in Logan Square, my great grandmother and um, her brother and sister owned it, and um, some of my, my my dad's cousin, my dad's Puerto Rican, my mom's family's Italian and Greek. So there was about uh, you know I don't know like eighteen of us living in this seven flat graystone at any given time, wow. and um, back then it's right at the corner of Fullerton and Sawyer. Back then the little alley. Um, separated us from what was a donut factory and so I would wake up to the fr to the smell of fresh made donuts every morning and since my great-grandmother was just kind of like the matriarch of the building who stayed home people came had coffee she would so she would make she, she would make dinner for the bakers bring them over dinner and they would give her fresh pastries and donuts every morning and then that's what she would have when people came over to hang out and have coffee throughout the day that's yeah. so beautiful, man. So was yeah. that a fun childhood then? That sounds amazing. It was, you know, it was, it, 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 it was pretty cool. I mean, it was so tight knit. I feel like, um, unfortunately for our family, as some of, um, you know, our older family members, you know, started passing on, everyone's lives started going in different places. People started moving out into the suburbs. My grandmother moved out to Elmwood Park. I had other people uh, you know, other family members who were moving in other places. So we weren't necessarily in the same place all yeah. the time. And there was something about that feeling, that energy, you know, every holiday was in that building. Everybody's birthday was in that building. The gypsy boys would come over and play music till like six in the morning on Christmas Eve and on New Year's Eve. And like the kids would be up. I used to fall asleep underneath the kitchen table because I didn't want to leave the party 
but I was, you know, like five years old and ridiculously tired. But, you know, like that feeling of family and community is something that I grew up around and that, you know, I I still yearn for. and, And it makes me sad that we no longer you know, have that. And a lot of us aren't really in the yeah. same place anymore. No, you know, it's, that's it's, not really. It's fractured no, and it's a bummer. No, I'm, I'm a child of divorce that your childhood was my dream childhood. That's what I always really wanted, but that's amazing. Yeah. So talk to me, where did the performing bug come in? Were your parents artists at all? Um, no, man, my, my, my pops worked two jobs uh, for as long as I can remember. My, my mother's a old school barber. Wow. <laughs> Um, and, um, but, and we had a lot of musicians in my family. So I have, you know, seen, you know, a variety of, of uncles and cousins play different gigs. Like I said, they would come over to the house, they would play really late at night and just kind of that energy of playing for each other and giving to each other and feeding off of each other. I learned, you know, from them very early on, um, my grandfather, uh, my, my mother's father who passed away. Uh, just after I turned two, used to sing in nightclubs. And everybody has always told me that um, he and I mirror each other very, very similarly. So I think Uh a lot of that, that energy and that bug that was in him, um, you know, got passed down to me genetically. And then, um, you know, I, 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 I try to take him with me you know, um, as, as much as I can, I actually named my production company after him. So, uh, yeah, it's amazing. So you got, you're doing, you're doing your own stuff as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, trying to anyway, you know, when you first incorporate, you know, when you get into, to, to, to that portion of whether or not you want to uh, incorporate for your privacy. And if you're going to start building a production company, you know, you, you you had to figure out what the name was going to be. And super early on, I was like, nappy polo productions that's because that was yeah yeah my grandfather's nickname was nappy uh, so and his last name was polo so to the loss brother to the loss that's amazing yeah. man uh, so then you. growing Appreciate up did, did you go into the city for theater oh yeah all the time i mean i mean i think one of my first theatrical experiences that i remember was like the wildest one they were it was um um in the theater district i don't remember what it was back then but we were going to see muppet babies the musical and they were filming the scene in child's play where the 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 guy i can't remember uh, raymond james something james i don't know who puts his soul inside the chucky doll yeah. when him and the guy are shooting at each other outside of the uh the toy store they were filming that scene under the randolph l tracks and um we like walked by it and were really nervous because you know back then in, in the mid 80s i mean it still isn't very well lit over there and back then it was even, even worse there. You know, you didn't, you didn't walk through there at night by yourself because you probably wouldn't make it through without getting mugged. So we didn't know what was going on. And then I remember we had like a PA usher us over, like you can watch, just be quiet. And that was my first theatrical experience and film experience mixed together all in one. And then we went to go check out Muppet Babies, the musical. And that was, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Quite different. That's amazing, man. And then in, yeah. in elementary or middle, like where did the drama program start to open itself up to you? Yeah, I went to a, a Spanish speaking preschool in Logan Square and um, we had a lip syncing competition and uh, I did La Bamba and I oh. won and I got to, I got to perform it on like the equivalent of whatever Telemundo was then. Um, and I think that's kind of where it started. I was in every play in every grade from like that point forward. I even played Martin Luther King Jr. at one point. And to this day, I still don't understand why, because we had black kids in my class, you know, and it was yeah. just kind of like, I understand. I was a talented. Seven yeah, player, you were pretty but, good, man. <laughs> but, but, but come on, come on, people. You know? <laughs> there, there was a, there was a, there was a teaching moment and an opportunity for all of us to learn from very early on, and they failed us. But you know, and uh, <laughs> and then we moved to Houston, Texas, when I was ten years old. Um, part of the reason was my mom's sister, her husband. 
and my first cousin, Sean, who was my only first cousin on my mom's side, lived there. And they wanted Sean and I to grow up together similarly to the way that we did in that Seven Flat Greystone and the way that they did because my mom was born and raised yeah. in that Greystone. And so we moved to Houston, Texas, and we got a house about a block and a half away from them. And I was there from when I was 10 till I was 18. And that's when things really started cooking. I was uh, playing a lot of baseball, a lot of basketball, very competitively and doing theater in middle school and yeah. high school. And then um, my pops passed when I was 15. Oh, I'm so uh, sorry, colon cancer. Oh, thank you, man. Appreciate yeah. it. Uh, colon cancer just came strong, man. Yeah. Diagnosed in December, passed away the following October. So it was kind of like a freight train for us. And baseball was was our thing and it just didn't feel right doing it anymore and i knew then i knew when i was 15 that i wanted to be an actor and that if i was going to go to college or any sort of university it was going to be through that vehicle yeah um so i stopped playing baseball i stopped playing basketball i got an agent in houston i started going out on commercial auditions i started doing a couple of plays outside at like you know like um local theaters i wasn't at like the alley theater yeah. or anything like we're, chopping we're, it up but we're link later and robert rodriguez and tarantino doing their stuff in austin at this time or uh i believe so link later was definitely around there there was always a bunch of talk of link later you know it, it wasn't until you know i think that i really got to college that i understood what link later and rodriguez and tarantino were actually doing and actually about yeah you know, when and, I was and in Wes high Anderson school. is Houston isn't he is he I think so that makes sense yeah that makes sense it sounds right it sounds right there's like a really affluent area of Houston that I know he came from because his like parents were very famous uh yeah, advertiser. Uh, Kingwood. Was yeah, Kingwood, yeah. Right? yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. that private school is- my my college roommates in that uh that first scene with uh God, what is that? Bill Murray and uh, the drummer from Phantom Planet. I'm, I'm, oh, right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel so bad that I can't think of it right now. You know, you know what, brother? I, I, I have just given up on trying to remember people's names at this point. It's just, <laughs> well, it's I Desmond, right? So, yeah, you know, well, <laughs> yeah, whatever you, whatever uh, you want at this uh, point. In my 20s, I could remember everyone's names. In my 30s, it's like, oh, uh, I'm, hey yeah <laughs> well so then talk to me being in houston obviously that's that's amazing yeah. that you got an agent you know commercials were great but you know having that yeah. riveting experience in childhood in chicago and especially that mm-hmm. theater you know community there that's I, mm-hmm. I i don't know the texas one so i'm not going to pretend to to know it but mm-hmm. did you feel like you know because like i don't know growing up in chicago what it looks like you know because like for most people, this business is binary. It's LA or New York. And now that's slowly sure. changing. You know, there's pockets, sure. there's Atlanta, Chicago, you know, New Mexico, mm-hmm. but for you, yeah, 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 yeah. The Guthrie, like there's so many great things for, for mm-hmm. Desmond. What did it, when you were 15 and you quit baseball and you were trying to figure this out, mm-hmm. did you have an idea of where you wanted to go and end up? Um, I, 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 I was, always really drawn to the theater school at DePaul University. Um, uh, uh, I I was baptized at St. Vincent DePaul. I was always very much aware that their program almost exactly mirrored Juilliard's. um, Yeah, because they have cuts, right? It, well, they used to. They 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 sw- they they stopped that a few years after I after I graduated. Wow. Yeah, because they switched over. They switched over, and I think they only do a first year invitation only back you know where they went from like with us they went from like 50 to 36 to 20 so there would be two cuts after the one after the first year one after the second year and now I think they just they they bring in closer to 60 and they get somewhere closer to 30 and it's not like sort of an exact science when I was there they only allowed 22 people to go on to the last two years of the of the BFA program so that's talk to me about that. Is it is that is that what's that like as an experience? Because I would feel on pins and needles the whole time. Sure, I mean, I and and you know, it was always something that was talked about, but at the same time, it's kind of a, a real world experience while you're paying for it, uh, which isn't necessarily 
healthy as an 18 year old. Yeah, probably, probably. But I, I viewed it very much as everybody, including my professors were colleagues. All of them were already working in the Chicago theater scene off Broadway on Broadway, coming back, teaching classes. So it was kind of like we were already working in the Chicago theater scene, even though we necessarily weren't at that time. And, um, I, you know, I just always thought to myself, Hey man, if I get cut, like that's, what's supposed to happen. It's not going to stop me. I'm in Chicago already. There's a, a, a variety and plethora of non-union opportunities here totally. that will allow me to get my feet wet and, and build who I am as a person and as an artist. So like that's pardon me, that's not going to stand in my way. And, you know, fortunately enough for me, I was able to, you know, make my way through the program. And I felt like I really got, you know, this, this toolbox that I'm able to just kind of dip back into whenever I need, you know, they really gave me, you know, the opportunities and the, and the, and the courage and the confidence to kind of really dip my toes into whatever medium is out there, you know? Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful for that. And our, and our grouping of people that we had together was really great. We're always pushing each other. And that's one of the cool things about uh, being in a class like that in an ensemble led city. Cause you know, like, you know, LA is all about producers, New yeah, York's basically God. all about directors. Chicago's all about the ensemble and building yeah. and, and working with playwrights and, you know, telling the story to the best of our ability without necessarily thinking about profitability. So we were already kind of doing that within our acting class. And it was a super easy transition for me afterward, you know, being in the Chicago theater scene. I actually, right after I graduated, I um, went to the Children's Theater Company in Minneapolis and um, worked there as an ensemble member with them for one season. So I did seven plays in 12 months there. Um, and that was super cool because I'd never been to Minneapolis before. Um, the, the, the theater culture there per capita, they have more theaters per capita than any other city in the United I States. I believe that. I, I've had the fortune. Because they're so small. Yeah. Yeah. What were we going to Oh, I've been, been there. there. Yeah, you worked I've, there. Yeah, no, no, no. I haven't worked there as an actor, but I, I toured with a rock band for a long time, so I saw that. It, oh wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First Avenue and all those like venues That's right just, around. Yeah, there. yeah. I met Prince. The no the way. Piece at First Avenue. Yeah. Did you get to see that him live? For, no, he was just there watching uh, open mic uh, beatboxing night, which I was like floored that prince is just walking in sitting in the back watching people get up and freestyle beatboxing like that's amazing it is and for me like i at the age of four i somehow saw the movie purple rain i don't think i was supposed to (laughs) in fact i know i wasn't supposed to but i was so enthralled with him and the love story between him and Apollonia that I found a broken guitar in my alley. This is back in Chicago in Logan Square. And I would walk up and down the halls and sing Purple Rain for anybody that would allow me to do it. Wow. So, yeah, it was, it was a really cool. And then, oddly enough, he died on my 33rd birthday. So oh. there's, there, there's a lot of Prince connection in my yeah. life I, even though you know well, when I the movie really happens let's let's start it here desmond for print <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna make it happen i'm calling oh, caa right dude, now dude. let them know, let them know. Uh, that's amazing man so then i know so your yeah. journey took you back to chicago yeah. and talk to me it about did. this this you know your early 30s at this point you're, you are no you know? no no back um uh mid mid to late 20s mid to late 20s um, i start yeah i started working pretty heavily with um teatro vista which i ended up becoming an ensemble member of and victory gardens and um chicago shakes and goodman and steppenwolf you know like there was a lot of a lot of cool collaborations that started going on because they yeah. all started forming these smaller upstairs sort of theaters and they were trying to fill it out with um, um, uh, voices of color and female yeah. voices and female playwrights. And, you know, um, and then their Victory Gardens did this 
um, their first ignition festival. And it was for playwrights under 40 who had never been produced any before. And I got called from Sandy Shinner, who was the artistic director then, who had just directed me in one of their main stage plays and said, hey, um, there, what, how do you feel about wrestling? And I was like, like high school singlet wrestling or like professional WWF style wrestling? Because it was still WWF then. Yeah. Um, World Wildlife and, uh, Foundation came in and said, no <laughs> more. I just yeah, watched no more the, for you people. Have you seen the David Arquette documentary? No, but Dude, I want to. You cannot kill David Arquette. It's about him winning the WWF. I just gave it an extra W title. And then how he's had to redeem himself because he takes wrestling seriously blew my mind. Highly recommend oh, wow. checking it out. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's in the queue. Yeah. That's in the queue. So then um, so then this script came across my desk. It's called The Elaborate Entrance of Chad Deity by yeah. Christopher Diaz. And um, I know it well. I went to NYU. We, oh, so yeah. 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 So we um we we did the first reading. Well, at first I read the opening monologue and I cried afterwards because I had never, other than seeing John Leguizamo's Freak, I've never read anybody's words or heard anybody's words that sounded exactly like what my life was like growing up. Yeah. And then I kept on reading the rest of it and it clicked with me on so many levels as a, as an ethnically ambiguous person, as a marginalized individual, as an individual coming from a lower, lower middle class family, um, as somebody who always uh, feels like they're having to break out of a box because people are too lazy and just want to compartmentalize you into the one thing that they know you fit in, right? Totally. And this is this is what this whole thing's about. It's a it's a hip hop satire about this underdog Puerto Rican wrestler from the Bronx dealing with issues of racism, capitalism, yeah. and stereotyping through the world of WWE style wrestling, right? I, I think so it's the best the play rating. since Motherfucker with the Hat for like lat, Latino. You know what I mean? Like those are the two plays that you. At, my last name's Perez, man. So I may not look yeah. it, but <laughs> yeah. You got. Oh no, I, I see it. I see it. But, we, but, but we know, see, yeah. we can, you know, yeah. depending on what our facial hair looks like, we can, yeah. you know, pass for a myriad of, of, uh, of ethnicity. So, you much more so um, than me. That's why your career is doing so much better. <laughs> you don't have a podcast. <laughs> it's because of, it's because of the nose, bro. The nose yeah. fools them, man. They're like, oh, look at that profile. Um, so that, but, that play uh, was a huge hit. Yeah, so that play is just kind of what jump started it all. It was um, immediately deemed um, a, a smash hit by the Chicago Tribune and everyone else, so much so that they took the picture of myself and Usman Ali, who uh, played Vigneshwar Pajwar, and we become um, a, a, a duo of, uh, of course, terrorists, you know, Che Chavez Castro. And he was the fundamentalist. He basically looked like Osama bin Laden. Yeah. And I looked like a Mexican mariachi drug lord who was ready to take you down. But that was at the top of the Tribune on the front page. It said Chicago Trib. And then it was our picture. And then you opened it up. And there was like a four-page spread about how this was going to change American theater as we knew it. So from that performance on, from whenever that came on, we had New York producers every freaking show, wow. which none of us in the cast had ever dealt with before. And I was looking for my opportunity to get to New York. I, I, I used to tell my mom when I was really young, one day I'm going to live in Brooklyn. And yeah. she was like, you don't even know where that is, but I just knew I would. And I yeah. did for some time. And um, so that show went to second stage. Uh, we had a really great run there. Uh, we already had Broadway producers behind us. And then just like in the play, um, rich white folks got in the way. They <laughs> <to make> it <laughs> God damn it. You know, they, they, yeah. they, want, they, they had a very specific idea of how it would be profitable. And we were trying to run on the idea that it's about family, that it's about community, that it's about underdogs. So if you start filling in this with a whole bunch of famous people, you're already taking the ensemble and the community out right. of it and, 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 Everything and, and that starting makes to it stick beautiful. What it what it yeah. is and beautiful and, and um and so that fell by the wayside. And then the Geffen Theater called and said, Hey, we want to give you guys another run 
and then let us take it to Broadway. And then um, the Geffen's in LA. I just want to get right. Yep. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, the Geffen's in LA, over in in Brentwood, where UCLA is. Yeah, and, totally. Um, and uh, everything seemed to be going well. Um, and then Gil Cates, who was running it, um, a, f- a couple months before we got there, had quadruple bypass surgery. And um, he was on his way. It was like our second week of rehearsals, walking from the theater to his car. Heart just stopped. And um, it was, uh, we, 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 we thought about stopping. And it just because it just, like, it just didn't, you know, when something like that happens, when someone with, with that sort of uh, hold on people, when yeah. something like that happens to somebody like that, and you, it's just kind of like, well, why are, why are we doing this? Is this silly play about wrestling? And then the Geffen itself was saying, no, like, we still um, think it's necessary. Gil would want it to go on. Let's keep doing it. So we did, and it never – you know, made its way to Broadway from there. But it but changed I felt your like career that, forever, you know? Yeah. I mean, between, yeah. between the production in New York and the production in LA, there were so many um, faces who had never even heard of me before, who were now well aware of um, what I could do yeah. um, and saw the possibilities of, of how much more I, I, I could do other than that, that, so many doors just started flying open for me and um, I transferred strictly to film and television and really haven't been back to theater since. I don't blame you, man. That, that, that's amazing. And so then obviously I imagine yeah. at this point when you have all these big faces and all these phone calls, you flex up agent wise, right? So you can get the film TV or do you stay? No, I stay. When I moved, I was with Stuart Talent in Chicago. When I moved to New York, yeah. When I moved to New York, I stayed in the family. I really connected with Don Burge and everybody who was there. um, And I was with them from, oh goodness, where are we in now? 20? 2010 to 2018. So I was in the Stuart Talent family for almost 11 years between Chicago and New York. And then I started just kind of getting an itch within myself like not that I not, not that things weren't going great I, yeah. I was coming off of a five-year run of a critically acclaimed television show on FX which is yeah one you're of the, the worst for those cable networks yeah. yeah yeah and um and there was just something inside of me that said it, if you don't do this now you might regret it later and yeah. I don't have a lot of feelings like that and when I approached Don about that, um, because I mean, we had become good friends. He knows yeah. my he you know he knows my wife. He knows my he knows my son. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're you know, I I'm all about building a personal relationship, um, well beyond whatever the professional relationship might be. Yeah. Because what we're doing is about human connection. It isn't just about you know people lining their pockets you know we're telling stories about humanity and you can't do that unless if you're humans with the people that you're working with and you know i just i you know i i, I it was the hardest thing for me and uh, i i just i let him know i was like i just i have this th- this thing and i feel like if i don't explore it i'm going to regret it for the rest of my life and um he was very gracious um about it and completely understood and um, then I started kind of taking other meetings and now I'm with Gersh and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy there. That's I'm great. still with my same manager, my same manager, James Suskin and the Roger Karshan. Glenn Fleshler and, uh, is, you know, uh, I, I've been trying to get with that team forever. One day they'll, they'll take me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, it's just kind of like the team has started, you know, continuing to build from there. And I, and, and, and I feel like, I have um, um, an extremely well-balanced community around me at this point. Not only are they bulldogs when they need to be bulldogs, but they're total softies and humans yeah. uh, when they need to be that with me as well. And we could you, go out to dinner and forget to talk about the business thing that we were there to have the dinner about in the first place. And that means the world to me because that's what I want. I don't, yeah. You know, like if this is only going to be about money, then if we better be making a hell of a lot of it, yeah, like so much, 
like so much that that's all we can talk about. It's like, well, this is going to, you know, do this. But like at the end of the day, like life isn't really all about money. You know, experiences are, I, I, I are, are, are way higher on, you know, my list of priorities than the actual amount of money that I have in my pocket. I mean, I feel very fortunate that ever since I moved to New York City, I haven't had a day job. I've been able to float myself as an individual. And now through this career, you know, I can float my family and there's always food on the table and, you know, kids' colleges, there's being money invested in that. And, you know, I mean, knock on wood, it it, it continues down this path for us. Um, but the, I mean, th- th- those are the priorities through this, not necessarily being stupid famous or stupid rich, because for the most part, everybody that I meet that's like that is also s- pretty lonely. Yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and the high that you're on for such a long time doesn't last. Yeah. And in the world of like social media that we live oh. in, where everybody's super selfish and super self absorbed and trying to give you like, the snarkiest hot take on oh. everything that comes out. <laughs> I, yeah. It's just such it's just such a lonely atmosphere that it's kind of like it's vapid you know, and hollow. Read, it is. Yeah. And I would just rather be like one of those guys like, hey, I saw him somewhere. Oh no, that's Desmond from You're the Worst or yeah. Desmond from Utopia. Wow, he's doing that. That's cool. Not necessarily like being you know, hounded on the streets for things. I mean, if, uh, if the that same ever career. happens, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if that ever happened, that happens and you deal with it, you know? I mean, the first big movie I ever did was Mr. Popper's Penguins with Jim Carrey. Yeah. And he was a huge influence on me, you know, in, in my early life. I mean, I don't know how many times I watched oh. Ace Ventura. Oh my God. I mean, all everything that Jim Carrey did, you went to the movie theaters to go see. But I'm sitting there and I was like, one day I was like, hey, Jim, can I just be a dumb young actor and pick your brain about a couple of things? And he was so gracious and willing about it. And I just asked him, I was like, hey, you know, we got like the paparazzi here. And between every take, they're just like in the bushes taking pictures of you. Like, does it feel like it's an invasion of your privacy? And he looked at me and he was like, at one point I thought it was an invasion of my privacy. And then I realized embracing them would give me more of the privacy that I coveted because once you give them the shot that they want, they kind of leave you alone for a little while and understanding that, that it's not like you against them, that it's an extension of all of us working together are, we're just bits and pieces that I would get from people like him and Paul Giamatti and Paul Rudd, like throughout my career and like now working with John Cusack and Rain Wilson on Utopia, it's kind of like I see things. And, and, and John's a Chicago guy. John's a Chicago guy. Yeah. And he's like never left. And you know, you think about it, like at one point, John was like the third most famous person in Chicago behind Michael Jordan and Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> and I guess, <laughs> you know, like at that point, and Belushi. And yeah. Belushi. So he was yeah. like the fourth, but like that's a very – amazing circle of people to be in, you yeah. know? And for like him to still just be like a normal sort of guy who rides his Vespa around Chicago and embracing it still and understanding that all of it's part of the game and that, you know, um, work is work and life is life. And sometimes they mirror each other and sometimes they mesh and other times they don't, and they don't have to, and you don't have to pick up your phone and, automatically instagram or tweet at something you can just kind of live your life under the radar when you choose to yeah and it's totally acceptable and continues to fulfill you in the ways that you as just a human need to be fulfilled i know man i can't wait to the day that i can get to your level where i can just delete this instagram button and never look back ever ever you know i'm close i'm 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 close i'm i facebook i left um a a few months before the 2016 election, it was just getting so negative. Yeah. I was the, 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 the messages I was getting, I was being, and, and I'm not like trying to be like, Oh, I'm an actor. I was being attacked. Like I was being attacked by people that I went to high school with that I, that are extensions of my family in Chicago 
you know, and, and part of me feels bad about leaving because I was having conversations with them, which were hard conversations, yeah. but conversations that needed to be had because as someone who's felt voiceless his entire life and who wants to give voice to those who feel voiceless, I completely forgot that they also feel completely voiceless. And even though they're not necessarily, you know, ethnic or lower income or, you know, their people as an, as a people haven't been marginalized for such a long time, they live a life just like the rest of us and don't always feel like they're appreciated and or represented. Yeah. Right. Especially by whatever administrations in there. And so we were having these conversations and then they were tough, but they were necessary. And then the onslaught of attacking started happening. And I was like, you know what? I'm just so angry. Every time I open this thing up, I'm out. So I did it. And, um, I'm dealing with that right now. So that's so, it seems kind of divine that you're like, I'm getting attacked, man. And I'm just like, yeah. It, It was the greatest release off my shoulders. I did it with Twitter about six months ago. I was opening up Twitter and I'd get pissed off about something. Yeah. And that affected, that affected me for the rest of the day with my children, with my wife, you know? And it's like, I'm just under, under the current, like I'm bubbling with, pardon me, all this steam because uh, of some coward yeah. on the internet who is just being a snarky dick for the sake of being a snarky dick and like to, you know, hear themselves masturbate 140 characters at any yeah. given time. Yeah. You know, not necessary. It's and often. then some guy so from stay- Germany sends us a message that stays in our head for two years. You know what I mean? And right. it's just a bomb. Mm-hmm. It's playing over right. and over and over again, even if it's not even yeah. remotely true, you know? Right. Well, then I, I, so, uh, so I'm just on Instagram. Yeah. I like it. I, I, I like it because I feel now I have a better understanding of the ability of when people can comment and when people cannot comment. And I'm actually better now at just not reading comments really anymore. And I get to post cool pictures about food and art and clothing, which I really dig. And I get to still talk about sports, which was my main thing for being on Twitter. Cause like the sports feed was always Crazy up to date. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm able to make Twitter what I want it to be instead of letting Twitter make me, I mean, uh, Instagram, I'm making Instagram what I want it to be rather than letting it make me what it wants me to be. Um, and, um, so far I'm doing well, but you know what, <laughs> uh, you told We're all me figuring it out, you. man. Yeah, well, right? I, I, Utopia I don't... is about to drop next week uh, on September 25th. And, um, y- you know, I play a, a, a genius conspiracy theorist who believes that this graphic novel tells the ill wills of our future. And it's a remake of a British show that was act- absolutely brilliant. And um, it's violent and it's dangerous and it's exciting and it's funny yeah. and it's heartfelt. And it's also eerily mirroring what we're dealing with now the backdrop is a viral pandemic that is killing children all across america and they don't know why um gillian flynn um who um uh uh, wrote this adaptation of it started with it seven years ago we shot it in chicago starting april of 2019 and finished at the end of september 2019 so months before any covid cases had actually hit or the actual term covid-19 was something that we felt isolated and frustrated about yeah. and so like this thing is about to happen and go down and ultimately i hope that it gives people the ability to um, um, escape a little bit and process what's going on and understand that even through these, this fictional reality and these characters that we're not alone. Cause I know we feel isolated and scared and unsure of what's going to happen yeah. and tired of what, you know, 
having to wear masks and feeling like we have to clean everything all the time. And, and it's like a really weird space to be in that's causing hella anxiety. So we're not only dealing with a global pandemic, we're dealing with a global mental health crisis. And how the fuck does anyone actually deal with that? Yeah. You know? And so I, I hope what this show does is it, is, is it takes those fears and those anxieties for those, for the people and it allows them to outlet it and process it in a, in just a different way so that yeah. we're not beating up on each other anymore. And, you know, maybe it gives us a bit of leadership since, you know, our American leadership is just so split. 50, 50, like, oh God. Ab- absolutely disastrous. So, yeah. you know, it, so the, by next week, I might be off Instagram. For, uh, <laughs> I might be too. <laughs> full circle. Yeah. Depending I'll, I'll on- courier owl you from the next podcast. <laughs> Well, dude, I don't want to gloss over your beautiful performance, you know, oh, I, I, on, on You're the Worst for five years. What was oh, it like you. living with a character for that long, you know? Oh, amazing, man. Even amazing. talk, I mean, I, was, Cash, I mean, so many amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it, it started off as a little engine that could. They paired us with the other show that was coming out, Married, which starred um, – Judy Greer and Nat Faxon, which obviously was like the premiere show. Yeah. And then we turned out to be kind of like the critical hit. And it was about, you know, four thirty somethings who pretended that they don't believe in love, but deep down really do. Yeah. So they do everything, you know, trying to obtain it, including ruining their lives and everybody yeah, else. Sort of nihilistic alive. in a way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? And like I got to dig really deep into you know, um, this really beautiful human named Edgar Quintero, who yeah. was uh, a, a PTSD. vet who had, had toured twice in Iraq, who's dealing with PTSD and a heroin addiction and just trying to transition into the civilian lifestyle. And um, I got to really connect with, and this was the best thing about social media during those five years, I got to connect with so many vets who were so thankful that we were showing this version of a vet right that he wasn't just some one no you know, disney character raging yeah. dude who was going to best buy and just beating the shit out of people all the time he had that in him and eventually we got to see what a day in the life of edgar was like in season three um when he decided to stop taking his meds i remember that season. went to the va and you, you know it was very um it, 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 it was such such beautifully crafted television by Stephen and our writers at yeah. that time, and they took such great care of us of uh, keeping jokes running throughout the four seasons and keeping things topical and letting yeah. people just be people and allowing us to be flawed and like actually putting those flaws on a pedestal and saying like, "Hey, yo, we're all flawed. Like, why are we trying to hide it? Why don't we?" embrace it and then try to help each other through it yeah. rather than just kicking this person to the side. Cause I mean, that's basically what we do with our young people. Yeah. We ask all of these young people to go do these courageous things that most of us, including our current president of the United States would not and will not oh do. And they see these horrific things. They come back, we throw them a party, we give them a steak, some beers, yeah. you know, Sometimes we get them laid and then the next day we fucking forget about them and are like, yo, I got my life. You deal with your life now. And the, the thing of it is like these people have been away from any sort of civilian lifestyle for a variety of years, yeah. sometimes decades. And you just expect them to uh, assimilate back to a world that looks familiar, but they don't really understand or yeah. know with without any coping community. mechanisms. Yeah. Right. And yeah. if they are dealing with any mental health issues, we're just going to give them a bottle of pills that we give everybody else yeah. and be like, Hey, sorry if your dick doesn't work, but at least you won't be like, you know, trying to take a gun into a movie theater. Yeah. You know, it's just kind of like, it's like, Whoa, like, what are we doing? What are we saying about, our value to them and how much we respect them and, 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 and ultimately cherish what they sacrificed in order for us to be free yeah. and to have the, 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 the stupid cell phones that are in our pocket all the time and the freedom just to go to whole foods and get pissed off that our, 
you know, vegetarian cheese, yeah. <laughs> cheese isn't stocked and ready to go. Yeah. You know, like we don't think about it in, in, in that no, totally sort not. of bubble, but I got the opportunity to for five seasons and I had people guiding me along the way, uh, vets that I met through Adam Driver's nonprofit Arts in the Armed Forces, yeah, which yeah. I worked with. You did some readings for him, me. right? Yeah. 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 And, you know, the, I, I still communicate with those vets to this day. You know, I ever once just, hey, what's up? How's the fam doing? You know, I heard the weather was bad there. I'm still riding yeah. in Michigan. Will you take a look at this for me? Give yeah. me sort of feedback. Like, and I, 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 I couldn't have asked for like a, a, a better sort of community to help give me the, the balls to, to do Edgar because wow. I was a little nervous about it at the yeah, beginning, man. Of course, I know, man. I know nothing about you, that lifestyle. This, the reoccurring theme of this podcast is the separation between good acting and great acting. And that is why you are a great actor. There's no other actor in the world that could have done what you've done with every role in your career, man. You deliver with such specificity, such nuanced choices. And you, it, it, I say calculate in the best sense of like, you know where you're going with this. You're not figuring it out as it's going. And, yeah. and, and, and in an organic sense, not in a, a negative right. connotation. You know what I mean? And right. that's, yeah, I got you. That, that's, that's master acting, man. And I, it's watching you act inspires me because I'm like, if I could do one-tenth of that, I'm cool. You know what I mean? Like, but you can, bro. Yeah. You just need the right, the, the, the right people around you. I mean, for, for I don't know how long I was always being – in in the same sort of vicinity, like I can do that. I want to do that. I'm, I'm yearning to do that. I, I just needed the right vehicles and people around me to, to give me the you. opportunity. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's basically all, you know, all it is because one of the things that I have trouble grasping is in such a creative profession people's imaginations stink you walk into a room and most of the time they want you to be that exact thing rather than seeing that you have that capability and allowing you to blossom by actually working with you it's not until you're like you know fucking daniel day lewis that someone's like hey look I want you for this. I know yeah. producers and investors don't think you're right, but I know you can. Let's make this shit happen. Yeah. But it's not until then that they allow that. Other than that, they just want you to do your thing. So my whole thing is I look at you and I don't know you very well, but in my mind, you can do anything. If you could, if you told me, yo, I can dunk, I'd be like, I believe you, you could yeah. dunk. Yeah. Not that very I many can't. Latinos can dunk. <laughs> no. right. I'm fine but, with the fact, but, but the fact is, is like there's these boxes yeah. that we that people want us to live in and think that we should be okay living in. And it's like, yo, I'm not I'm not one box. I'm not even two boxes. I'm like a billion different boxes, man. And as long as you I, I, give me a safe space to like stretch out, like you'll see how many of these boxes we can actually hit. And it'll be beneficial for both of us. It's not like it's just going to be good for my career. Like yeah. you'll be learning as well along the way about your craft and giving opportunity. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's like a whole catch 22 scenario. Yeah. Right? Man. Uh, well, this is probably one of the most beautiful conversations I've ever had. I'm actually like, I'm speechless because you pretty much articulated everything beautifully that I've ever wanted to ask without even having to ask it. So it's like, I just, the gratitude that I have for you for, for coming on and, and spewing this, you know, kind of like open-ended conversation about the monstrosity and how to make sense of something that is senseless and, and how you did this and survived through it. It doesn't, it means so much to me, man. Like I'm, I could cry, you know, I, I, I oh, think, thank you. I, 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 I'm so excited for Utopia and I know it's going to be huge for you. And I just kind of want to end, you know, on a, on a, on, on two final questions, man, you know, for that, for, yeah, I don't want to say just the actors, for the artists listening, for the aspiring writers, directors, 
you know, the, even like the aspiring people that are going to go in the armed forces, for anyone pursuing some kind of dream, what, what advice mm -hmm. would you have for them? Oh, um, understand what success means to you and strive for that. Don't strive for other people's visions of what your success should be. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you have to look yourself in the face, in the mirror, in your face, and be okay with the decisions that you made and the path that you're taking because nobody's path is exactly the same. And the things that you think are going to blow you up never do. <laughs> sometimes don't. And the little things that you think are dumb and stupid are probably the next thing that's going to get you to that next yeah. phase or level that you want to be in. Um, and ultimately, no, you're not competing against anybody else. Everyone's like, Oh, it's me versus this person. And no, man, it's you versus you. If you do your work, you go in there, you're open and available and easy to work with and eager to make the best story, product, whatever possible, then you are doing your job and everyone else around you will see that, aspire to be more like yeah. you and talk about it. So that the next time you're in that office meeting or that you're going into that audition or whatever the case may be, they'll be like, oh, I remember, I remember that dude from that one time. Yeah. It's pretty fucking good. Yeah. I think this is the opportunity now because yeah. there's been so many times where I haven't got things that I've absolutely wanted. Yeah. And later on, those same people have called me back for something that's abs absolutely better than what I was so heartbroken about that I didn't get the first time. And, and that's why I got to so, say, Sig and Steve have been Sig those guys for me, you know, like, so yeah. I, 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 I love that. I just wanted to, I'm not trying to stick and Steve. I'm sorry, dude. I'm not trying to blow you guys, but you guys have been so good, <laughs> you know, but man, that's no, amazing. True. And, and true. Desmond, man, I, I think, I think you're going to be, you know, next year I'm going to have to go through 17 channels of CAA to get you to come back for yeah. season two. <laughs> no, not at all. Not yeah. at all. We'll, make, we'll, we'll make it happen. I love but, to come back and chat with you anytime. I, 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 I'm sure you can tell I very much enjoy this. Like me too. Like man. I said, yeah, this, yeah. Is, this, this, this is the heart of what art is. And I yeah. didn't mean to rhyme there, but like, this is what it is. It's about talking. It's about challenging. It's, it, it's about inspiring. Right. And we don't do it enough. And most of the time we're just looking into this thing and not paying attention to, I know we're over the internet yeah. right now, but like, this is real human connection and yeah. this is what I yearn for. So I, I very much appreciate you having me on, man. It's been, been a blast. I'd love to do it again. Yeah, let's do it again. But you literally predicted my final question, which is what's keeping you inspired <laughs> right now? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. And my, and, my, and my children, man. I mean, you know, you try to think about silver linings and the oddest situation that we all find ourselves in right now. And um, the first couple of years that my, when my son was born, he's four now. Are you a teacher between now? And, teacher. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm learning. My wife's yeah. a much better teacher than I am, but I was back and forth between LA and New York quite a bit shooting. You're the worst. And even though they would be out there with me, I was missing moments. And my wife and I were uh, hashtag blessed enough to have our second child last December. Congratulations, um, a brother. girl. That's Thank you. you so much. And I have been here every moment of every day and it is the most inspiring and greatest thing that has ever happened to me i'm so i'm i it's sick it, it it makes me sick to my stomach that people are hurting right now but i get to spend every morning being woken up by my son and my daughter and spend the entire day with them and um i'm definitely a, a, a better human now because yeah. of it so um thank you covid but don't thank you covid yeah you know <laughs> thank you Des. sort of sort of thing you know man no, thank, thank you. you for coming on i such gratitude and i'm so excited for you and today today's monday so what day is utopia coming out 
Uh, Friday, September 25th, because what day are we on now? September 17th, so eight days from now. Okay. All eight episodes will drop on Amazon Prime, and um, um, all English-speaking countries around the world will get it. And then on October 23rd, any non English speaking countries will then have it dubbed into whatever language um, they speak on Amazon Prime. It was penned by the magnificent Gillian Flynn, who was a first time showrunner. We yeah. had, um, and I got, and I got to throw this out there because this is like the real deal. Please, please. When we, uh, Sasha Lane is our, our female lead and a lady of color. Ashley Lathrop is also one of our female leads and a lady of color. And the majority of our executive producers and almost every department head was one of the most ridiculously talented, caring, kind, thoughtful, charismatic women that I have ever met in my life. And the experience that I had on this set was smoother than any other set that I have been on. And if this is what it's like when we put these strong, thoughtful, caring, ridiculous, ridiculously talented women in charge, sign me up for it nice. every day of the week. No offense to the gentleman, but like yeah. it's time. Yeah. It has been time. And I am extremely proud of this coming out, knowing that I had that sort of support and guidance around me. So. I love that. And I can't wait to check it out. Desmond, let's do this check again, brother. Let's grab coffee sometime yeah, in brother. Brooklyn. I'm wishing you Sounds nothing good. but luck with this teaching chaos that's coming up. And I can't wait to <laughs> see the show, man. Yeah. Thank you so much, yeah, brother. Enjoy. All right. Thank Absolute you so much. Absolute love. Peace. All right. Talk Be soon. Good. Stay safe. All right. Go you vote. too, brother. I am thrilled to announce that An Actor Despairs is partnering with a wonderful CBD company called Kind Farms. Everyone out there has heard of CBD. I started taking it a few years ago when I first started getting sober and to help with my anxiety. Sadly, as one can do, I was overtraining in the gym and a friend recommended a topical and a tincture to help with the pain. I tried it. It was okay. However, recently, I was introduced to a product that has really changed my life. Not only has it helped me with anxiety, but I am stronger than I have ever been. I'm able to carry out lifts my body used to prevent me from doing. Kind Farm products have single-handedly changed my life athletically and personally. They utilize 100% local licensed farmers, organic cultivation, and CO2 extraction for superior CBD. Kind Farms is turning CBD to a kind alternative to pharmaceuticals. Let's transform tobacco row into hemp row. If you want to get involved, please reach out. Together, we can make a difference. You can use my code RYAN10 for 10% off. You can find them on Instagram at Kind Farms Inc. All one word. That's K I N D P H A R M S I N C. And their website is kindfarmsinc.com. Once again, my code for 10% off is Ryan10.